What's going on, Badger Nation? Welcome to the PPC Den Podcast, your home for all things Amazon PPC, tips, tricks, and strategies to make your Amazon advertising a little bit easier, a little bit more profitable. Uh, you can get a checklist of all of the goodies we've ever given away for every episode in the link below, organized by category, uh, organized by level of experience as well. So check that out. Today, I'm really stoked because we have Abe from XP Strategy. Uh, Abe, uh, great guy. I'll say it on the show. Uh, great guy. I met him uh, on a panel many months ago. Uh, we ended up talking and uh, it's been great getting to know him. Uh, I like the way his mind works. I love this conversation we have about branded, the age old question, branded traffic in your PPC campaign. How much is too much? Should you have it? Uh, he did a little experiment and we talk about it. So it's a good one. Tune in and I'll see you inside the Badger Den. I've launched campaigns and picked keywords. I've got my bits, set placements too. Now bad mistakes. Abe, what is up? Thanks for coming on the show. I am really excited to have you on. Well, thanks for having me. It's been, uh, I, I've been a long time listener, and I guess this makes me a first time caller, sort of. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, thank you so much. I, I love what's going on in your office over here. Uh, do you have, can you share anything about what's on this awesome shelf behind you? Oh, boy. All right. So, uh, yeah, lots of Funkos. And my thing with Funkos is I like to buy them in pairs. Okay. Because like, for, for some reason, I like to have natural pairs of things. Mm -hmm. um, this is like a selection. At home, I've got a lot more. But let's see. If you're a fan of the Umbrella Academy, I've got Hazel and Cha-Cha there. Nice. If you're a fan of uh, Miami Vice from the 80s. Nice. We've got Crockett and Tubbs. Nice. <laughs> if, if you grew up watching cartoons that were completely inappropriate by today's standards, we've got Tom and Jerry. Oh yeah, I, th I think I see, is that Dexter from Dexter's Lab? It is Dexter and Dee Dee, yes. Uh, oh yeah. So we've got Dexter and Dee Dee, and last but uh, certainly not least, our Garth and Wayne from uh, Wayne's World on Saturday Night Live. Oh, I see it, I see Wayne's World, yes. So back on the bottom, I actually have the only two singles, or two of the only singles. They were both given to me as gifts, so that's why they actually get presents. Mm -hmm. So we've got the little Coke can with that little jingle, uh, if I could buy the world a Coke, mm -hmm. and my very favorite football player, Lawrence Taylor, the only defensive player to ever get an MVP award in the National Football League. Give it up to LT. Yes, indeed. That guy, did not, that guy did not need to practice. He did not need to prepare. All he did was like smack himself in the face and uh, <laughs> everybody else needs to watch out afterwards. That's what I do every before I hit record. <laughs> That's what I did right before now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I apologize to all the listeners out there. Abe and I are both... Um, from the East Coast around the New York City area. So we talk very quickly. So if you normally listen to podcasts on like 1.5x, it'll be like a, a true like 2.5. So we're going to increase the speed. So I apologize ahead of time. <laughs> oh boy. Um, now I'm going to self-consciously speak slowly. <laughs> Welcome to the PPC Den podcast. Uh, Abe, we're talking about a great... I can't do it. I can't no. do it. I've already I've already thought about like the next five sentences, but in all seriousness, uh, I am super stoked to have you on the show. Uh, we've been talking over the last few weeks, months. I think we were on a virtual panel, uh, and I I have a good sixth sense about these things, and I really liked what you had to say. And then we ended up meeting in Austin, uh, and it was great. And we've 
been talking since then. So I really appreciate getting to know you. Yeah, likewise. It was mm-hmm. uh, it was a lot of fun. The coffee was very tasty. And uh, yes, uh, the panel was a lot of fun too. So I'm glad to be here today for sure. Okay. So a topic that you were excited about, and I love this topic. I could talk forever about this topic. I could talk about this topic for the next four hours, easy, easy, no prep. Uh, and the question is, the timeless tale, tale as old as time. You get a call from a client or you're looking at your campaign performance, you're looking at your search term report and you look at what you get orders for, you look at how you spend your money and you zoom in on something and you're like, wait a second, I'm getting a lot of spend for my brand name. Wouldn't they have purchased from me anyway? Do I need to bid on my own brand name? The age old question. This question, I love it. Do you love it? What what comes up for you when, you know, whether you're looking at an account and, and this comes up for you and people ask you, like, what comes up for you? Not again. Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> that that's my impression. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I have I have an ad agency. I have a number of clients across all different categories. And um the question you described comes up often from them. I see it all the time. So it's just part of what I see. It's part of the flow of information we work with. Mm -hmm. Um, And I have my ideas and impressions and, you know, I I sort of have my understanding of the way Amazon works and and the way shoppers behave. Mm -hmm. But, um, and branded search or searches for your own product fits within that ecosystem. It's just Mm -hmm. part of the way things get purchased and we have to fit ourselves in there and and be present for those searches. Yeah, I love what you said right there. There's a, it's like the natural state of just buying things online. Uh, may we be a brand so lucky to obtain brand recognition. May we be so lucky to have people type in our brand name when they go to buy things, right? And once they know you, they will search you. And like, that's a little bit of a blessing because on the other end of the spectrum, if you have zero branded traffic, if nobody knows your company, that's a pretty hard time. Mm-hmm. It is, yeah. So- Lots of brands on Amazon, lots of smaller brands have an uphill battle in which they have to get people to start searching for them instead of search instead of searching for the thing. So, mm-hmm. you know, if you sell a coffee stir, you know, it, it's really hard to be Joe's coffee stirs. But if you mm-hmm. can get to the point where people are searching for Joe's coffee stirs, you've sort of gotten yourself into your own space of one, which mm-hmm. is great. That's a great place to be. Big time. And, and there's a sort of like... Uh, you know, how do I get people in the beginning? You're trying to get people to know about your brand. Fast forward months, years. Now you're looking at how much people are spending, uh, how much you are spending to serve your ads for your own brand related terms. And then the question comes up, should you keep spending money on these keywords that are your branded keywords? And what I think is so cool about, about this is like, you actually did a little experiment with a with a client, uh, which I think is so fascinating. So anytime we get to test something for real and watch what happens, uh, I always think that's so valuable. I think listeners out there think it's valuable too. Uh, and I also have a lot of questions and and because I'm always thinking, you know, we have one test for one client, and then I am, I'm always thinking like, you know, what could what's the story behind the story? So I'll have some follow up questions too. But uh, I love when, so thank you so much for coming here with a real life situation. So what was that situation? So I imagine, you know, somebody asked you, hey, do we have to spend all this money on our branded terms? Can we do something about this? Yeah, I'll give you the, uh, maybe I'll give a a minute or two of the background also to start. This client has a product which they patented and they've got their own brand name for their product, but it's in a space where there are similar non-patented products that are a third of the price. They're selling their product for $40, and the competition sells this non-branded, non-patented product for a dozen dollars, $12.99, which is fine because as part of your patent, you've got protection against people creating the exact same thing. They have a good, clever name for their product, and they sell many, many thousands of units every single month. They're good. Mm -hmm. Um, But at the same time, those competitors sell more units every single month and they are attracting sales. So that's happening. 
Um, so this is the context of where their product exists in the marketplace. They have a lot of sales. They have a known brand that gets branded searches. They have a product that nobody else can exactly duplicate, but they do have competitors who are selling for much less. And the ongoing conversation that I've had with the client is how to um, protect the brand while ignoring the competition. Because on one hand, they sort of want to protect their brand. They built it. They want to make sure that they are taking care of their, their product and their brand in the world. Um, on the other hand, they sort of don't want to have to worry about somebody that's ten dollars compared to their forty. If they're can you selling, highlight, mm -hmm. can you highlight what you mean by that when the they're talking about protect their brand? What does that mean? Um, protect their brand simply means that um, when somebody is looking for their brand, they want to make sure the shopper buys their product. They mm -hmm. don't want to lose the sale to anyone else. Mm -hmm. They want to reinforce that their product is high quality. They want to reinforce that their product has a uh, a bright presence. And what do I mean by a bright presence? One of the things we do is we run sponsored brand ads, the headline ads across the top. So when somebody searches for the brand, we have a sponsored brand headline running across the top, which is colorful and shows the products and has a nice caption, which explains how great they are. And this makes people feel good about the search they just did. Mm -hmm. It reinforces and it protects the brand. Mm -hmm. Whereas somebody, if somebody in, in a world where they have a cheaper option, they want to feel good about spending more. And the, that reinforces and helps them, the shopper feel good about spending more on their product. Um, so you're saying that, you know, obviously any, any brand wants to protect it. So you were, you were running these brand protection campaigns, you know, the, the top of search, top of search keywords, I imagine for sponsored products, the headline search ad placement for sponsored brands, like all of those good things on their branded terms. And I, and then I'm just assuming what happens next, that number crept up a lot of like how much that brand defensiveness ended up costing them. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly what happened. They looked at two things. They looked at the cost per click. They said, why are we spending this much per click? Um, we shouldn't have to spend anything per click. The shopper wants us anyway. And in addition to the price per click, they were looking at the total dollar spent. So they said, why are we spending this many dollars for a thing that people want us anyway? Mm -hmm. um, now, the cost per click was actually easy to explain. And that should have been the wake-up call to them. I said, the cost per click actually reflects what other people are trying to spend for your product, for your keyword. So if, you're, if our cost per click is $3, the reason it's $3 is because somebody else is actually willing to spend $2.99. Mm -hmm. So if they're willing, and, and not only that, because you are hyper relevant, they act, you're actually getting a discount at the $3. Mm -hmm. The competitor is probably actually bidding 4 or $5 for the yep. click. And they're losing to you at 3 but you do have to spend that $3. You won't get it for $0.25. Cents. The $5 will at some point overwhelm a low $0.25 cent bid, even though you are the thing. Mm -hmm. So that's very that was very clear to explain why the cost per click was there. And it also looks like, just in some of the data that you sent over, it looks like maybe 30% of the ad spend was going towards branded traffic. Correct. Uh, if, if I'm doing my math correctly, yeah, about 30%. So that's that's pretty significant. And I think any company would ask themselves, hey, what would happen if you know, we cut that down by half? You know, Would we actually lose anything? Like, Have we passed to the point of diminishing returns with bidding on brand stats, which I I actually don't hate that question. I think it's a it's a fair question to say like, hey, could we get the same impact for maybe 5% less branded spend or 10% or 20%? I think that's a fairly valid thing to experiment with. But a lot of times the question is often like, can we just turn this off? And anyone listening, I, I think, you know, insert that sort of um, into the game plan too. Because, you know, I, I do think there could be a time where maybe you are overspending on branded, but... I would say that's going to be pretty rare. And again, that's why you did this experiment. Like you basically did exactly that. Um, so client thinks your client thinks too much spend on branded traffic. What was that conversation like in terms of 
just turn it off, reduce it by 5%, cut it in half, do a 10th of it. You know, what kind of options were explored at that point? So the client was pretty adamant that they wanted to turn it off. Mm -hmm. They felt like um, the shopper is looking for their product. The shopper will buy their product. Mm -hmm. Simple as that. And I was... I was adamant, but polite, as you have to be. Mm -hmm. um, but I was strong in my position that that's not the case. And I tried to make the point in a few ways. I go, first of all, I have run this experiment for other brands, yeah. and there has been a consistent result. There is no, There hasn't been a situation where it worked, where somebody turned it off, and they, can, they kept their brand integrity with, with sales. So that's right off the bat something I was able to say that I've done this a dozen times before and I can tell you most likely what's going to happen the 13th time. So that was the first thing that I said. Um, the second thing that I said was reducing small amounts is a challenge because there is variability in your spend even if you don't do anything. Mm -hmm. If my budget is uh, $10 a day, some days I'll spend $9, some days I'll spend 6 and some days Amazon will overspend and spend 12 And that's like a 35% swing on a daily basis. Yep. So saying you want to trim things by 5 or 10%, um, is challenging in its execution. I can certainly try it. I wish I could, but I can tell you that most likely, unless we're talking six-figure numbers, it's hard to tweak things by percentages like that. It's just the reality of what an experiment would look like. And Michael, if you have like insight on how you might try to tweak things with spends of that amount, I, I would certainly love to hear it. Mm -hmm. But that was my initial reaction when the point during the conversation said, let's make smaller adjustments. Mm -hmm. I said, you can't get clear data about what a smaller adjustment did. Um, there was a third factor. This was happening in the middle of December. So running a change like this in the middle of December was immediately going to have to factor in drops that would happen as, as you get close to Christmas. We started this experiment on December 19th, which was already when the biggest peak of the sales went by. So we were going to have to try and normalize for the drops anyway. And I guess the way that we normalized for it was by looking at the drops in non-brand spend. I said, okay, non-brand drop by this. Did branded, did branded sales drop by a similar percentage or did it drop by a different percentage? Um, so that was the way we tried to, to normalize it. And actually what, what the client had wanted to see was that sales didn't drop. So that would, that would have been the correct result of the experiment from their perspective. They would want to say, we're going to spend zero, but we're going to make the same sales. I'm like, That's the right. null hypothesis, that branded traffic has no impact on everything else. Uh, right. So if you, sh if you sh turned it off and nothing changed on the other side, then you would know that branded traffic did not have an impact. So that's the null hypothesis that you are uh, proving or disproving when you run an experiment. Yeah. Exactly. So that was the result that they wanted. They wanted to turn off the ads completely and see what sales look like. Um, the compromise that we came up with was that I would reduce spend greatly. We cut it down by something like 90% or 85%. And I said, guys, um, I don't want to turn off ads completely. I generally don't like turning ad campaigns off and on because Amazon does like consistency in ad campaigns running, and they'll treat your campaign worse when you turn it back on after having been off for a few weeks. So let me leave it on with a small spend. It'll be like uh, statistically very minimal, but let it keep running. And they're like, all right, we can, we'll, we'll give you that. So um, that was what we did. We basically went in, we capped out the spend on a daily basis. Um, there are so much going on and I, I actually forgot whether we put hard caps on the campaign numbers or whether we actually went in each day and turned off the campaigns at like 10 a.m. or something. I think it was the latter for some reason. Um, oh, actually, it was the latter for some reason, for a specific reason. Unfortunately, some of the campaigns that I took over when I came into this account had a few branded keywords within non-brand campaigns. Right. And although it's not perfect hygiene, we left it in there because they were performing well. So you don't want to break a thing that's working. And because we can see we can see that keyword in that space is working well, I didn't want to strip it out. So we left it in there and we knew where it was and what it was, and we just let it do its thing. 
Um, so we went into those campaigns and we turned off those keywords at those days, um, those days and those times. So we did it every single day, starting December 19th, going forward, and we evaluated it about three weeks later. So we looked at most of December compared to the three weeks after December 19th. And uh, the drop-off was spectacular. Um, sales, what the client had wanted to see was either no drop-off in overall sales of, of the brand overall. I mean, they would have expected the account overall to sell the same amount mm -hmm. because ads were not doing anything and those sales were gonna happen anyway. Um, that's not what happened. The proportion of sales in the account dropped by more than the proportion of spend we dropped for the branded terms. So we dropped branded terms 85%. Ad sales for branded terms dropped 85% or so, like in lockstep. And the overall account dropped more than 85%. Right. Even normalizing for the drop off of Christmas. Yeah, there's normally not an 85% drop off after Christmas. No. No. So it was bad. Yeah. So again, to, just to clarify, if branded terms had no impact, you would have expected a similar level of sales after turning off branded traffic. Uh, however, branded traffic was turned off and sales dropped by more than they should have. Well, they shouldn't have dropped at all if branded traffic had no impact. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I've seen this time and time again. And it's cool that you did this experiment and you tracked it so well. And it's it's so tricky to you know, like you mentioned, run a truly perfect experiment because I, like you mentioned, like doing nothing, your January results will be different than December versus February. There'll always be different. Like there's always just variability in normal traffic flows and conversions. Yeah. The, the best we can do is to get an idea of a thing in a lot of cases. Even the numbers I sent you were a little bit wonky because of Amazon's reporting. I didn't, I, I gave it to you right after we ran it. If right. I would probably rerun the data like today, there would be like a five or 10% difference in numbers and spaces, but top yeah. line numbers don't change though. Mm -hmm. You know, there's some interesting, interesting thoughts at a client one time and something like 85% of their ad sales were branded and it was, they were spending a lot, uh, every month. So it was something like, a maybe a hundred thousand dollars every month and 85,000 on branded tra traffic. And it was interesting because their product, if you just search their product, it was such a high volume generic term. Um, so I always use shoes, for example. So let's just say it was shoes and they were a certain type of shoe. So that means if you searched shoes, you compete with every single type of shoe there ever could be. So that forced people looking for them to do, oh, I don't want any kind of shoes. I want brand shoes. You know, I want Nike shoes or whatever it was. But um, that forced so much branded traffic for them. Where like, I, again, I've, I've never seen an account have branded traffic to such a high degree. And, um, you know, the question was like, you know, same kind of thing. Let's cut it in half. Let's turn it off and like see how it impacts it. And it's true. Like for some people, branded traffic is sort of deep in the funnel. For other people, it could be sort of middle funnel where people maybe don't fully know exactly what they want, but they want something in the category of your brand. So I think for some people, it is like a navigational term where it's like, or I'm sorry, a research-based term where it's like, I want to find out more about this brand. You know, I want to find out a little bit more about this stuff. And it's very likely that that person who wants to find out a little bit more about something will see something else that steals their attention. So let me ask, I, this story leads me to a question. Um, my initial, My initial impression when I hear a scenario like that is that if you just eliminate the numbers, like if you take out the number 85,000, 15,000 and 100,000 or whatever the numbers are, mm -hmm. normally if you had dropped a zero off of those numbers or dropped two zeros off of those numbers, the feedback would typically not be to drop branded spend, but it would be to increase non-brand spend. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in this scenario, just with bigger numbers, was any part of the conversation, keep this 85K 
spending for a brand because this is the solid foundation of your business sales and expand into the non-brand space better? Yeah, there were a couple of things going on. Uh, I remember they had a hard budget cap, uh, which was like a percentage of their total revenue. And that that was a little bit of it. The challenge with that particular situation was that the non-branded terms were so generic. Uh, so imagine if like you're selling a specific kind of product like trail running shoes. It's going to be really hard to go after shoes because you don't really know what the person wants. Uh, you know, do they want a fashionable shoe, a basketball shoe, this, that, or the other kind of shoe? So the generic terms were really difficult. So even if it was a trail running shoe, it's like, well, you can go after running shoes. Well, that's a generic term that's non-branded, but like running shoes could also mean like running on the track or running on the street or running on this, that, or the other thing. So they f- they sort of fell into this area uh, that I don't see very often where like the brand was part of the category. The brand was like an identifier for like the type of thing that you're looking for, where it sort of it it it, it, it gives some search intent. It gives some intent about like what price range a person is looking for. It gives some search intent about like what style of the thing they're looking for. Uh, it gives some search intent that allows it to become really really high converting. And because they were different, those generic terms had a really hard time. Would it be fair to say that there was a uh, shallow keyword depth? Absolutely. Yeah. That, that's a big term. That's a great, that's that's the term, shallow keyword depth. And it was a great brand too. And part of the reason they had so much branded traffic because they had an amazing, amazing, so, uh, so they had an amazing social media presence. They had influencers, like people would see them and then come and search them. So like all the things you would want in a brand. And yeah, they just had a really shallow, non-branded keyword depth. They, you know, really difficult to convert. Right. Yeah. Some, w- there's a thing that, uh, there are two things that oppose each other in the discussion about Amazon ads. There's lots of discussion about long tail and there's so much money to be made in long tail keywords. But there is also a reality that for many types of products, shallow keyboard depth is a thing. Mm -hmm. There's only a few ways people look for a thing. And there isn't 900 combinations of like 11 word phrases for this thing. (laughs) No, people look for a baseball cap you know, they might look for a baseball cap with a snapback. They might look for a fitted baseball cap, but there isn't much more than that. That's it. It's not like a, uh, a garlic press with a stainless steel handle and a, you know, rubber edge. That you might get long. You might get longer with that. Yeah, it it is interesting. Uh, with that particular situation, one thing that we did do uh, was we sort of said, let's lower the target. I'm sorry, let's uh, lower the target ACoS, where it was like, okay, our branded traffic has like an 8% ACoS. What would happen if we reduced bids this month by 10%? Uh, and that did, that's why I mentioned the thing in the beginning, where I was like, I, I actually don't hate that because we did do it and it actually did, we like did achieve a better, especially at that volume. At that volume, we spent a little less on the branded traffic and it didn't seem to have like a massive negative impact um you know because if you know we can save 10 grand on the branded traffic it's possible that you know we might not lose all 10 grand of that revenue we might lose some of it but we might you know eventually maybe net a little bit more but again we're like splitting hairs like it's really difficult to make that work like okay you're going to take off 10 grand of branded traffic okay that's great And maybe you only, you know, miss out on, you know, a few grand of of sales. Right. You drop your spend by 10 grand, you lose five grand of sales. You've technically got more profit. Mm, Right. But then the the flip side of it is you've got uh, five grand worth of merchandise sitting on your shelf (laughs) that didn't get sold yet. Yeah. So so there's so many considerations. And it's like really, it's a lot of work for a little reward, right? Yeah. I think in... You know, it's it's there is this little push and pull. I think anyone who does PPC, who's looking at like the performance of it, is always going to want to like go, like invest in brand defense. On the business side, I do think there's a lot of like our ad costs are just generally high. That could be a place to do it. And like, there's this feeling I think a lot of brand managers have where it's just like maybe my account is different. Like maybe I can drop it a little bit and not have any you know, 
net loss. And I, I do think there's a little bit of that. And, you know, I, I do that in my own business sometimes too, where I'm just like, ah, I got to try it for myself. Uh, so, I, you know, maybe there is a little bit of business intelligence that needs to be gained. One of the things that's important and one of the ways that I provide value for the businesses I work with is the ability to frame things. Yeah. So having someone to bounce an idea off of or having someone to bounce the results off of a lot of times ends up being useful. Um, I try to like frame all the positives and the benefits both before and after an experiment and like let them make their own decision. So even in the example that you gave, so I said, listen, I would have framed it like you've got two, you got two different considerations out of this. On one hand, you probably netted some extra amount of money, but you also sold fewer units and selling more units has an overall benefit for your business. Mm -hmm. Being able to say, I sold more, even if it's at a slightly lower margin is better for your brand. More people have those shoes on their feet. That's mm -hmm. it. That's mm -hmm. better. Mm -hmm. Long term, more shoes on feet is better. That's it. That's the that's the general rule for a shoe brand. So you might want to weigh the benefit against the potential on the other side. Mm -hmm. And that could be a, a thing to wake up, which is outside the numbers. The numbers say a, a simple thing. Numbers say, hey, you sold a little bit less, but you made more margin. But that leaves the reality of inventory outside. So I can come and say, I can come and bring that in in a lot of cases. Sometimes I just confuse things, but in a lot of cases, it can bring a little bit of clarity. No, I, I love that. I love that word framing, uh, framing up the situation. Like what are the pros and cons of doing this? Uh, absolutely. Um, cause you know, you, in that situation, you, they did it at the expense of market, basically market share. Uh, you know, it's likely that somebody, they ended up somewhere else. Love this topic. And I think like, do you do branded, non-branded reporting? as a default, like you do that all the time or do that only in specific situations where the client asks for it? Um, I do it in two situations. Of course, I do it when the client asks for it. And I do it in situations where we're dealing with a strong brand. Yeah. So the default with most Amazon first brands is the brands are not significant presences in and of themselves. So in that case, splitting out branded spend and branded results is not typically a useful piece of information. And um, one of the things I try to do with my reporting is to give the information which is going to be useful. I can give a report which, which has 250 data points on it. And every single time I send it out, I will get questions about a thing which I can't affect or didn't affect the account or just looks weird. But the reality is you need five data points, you need eight data points. Mm -hmm. So splitting out branded and non-brand multiplies the data points for each type of spend. And it can be confusing. So if it's not going to be useful to our understanding of the account, better not to spend the time on it. Mm -hmm. And do you like to, I think everyone has different preferences, a different, you know, sometimes you need to do it, sometimes you don't need to do it. But in terms of like, you know, we use the word hygiene, like the branded, non-branded traffic hygiene. You know, some people create campaigns and then it's called non-branded campaign. They will go in and negative phrase the brand. They'll add their ASINs as negative ASINs. Uh, they'll be really firm with, this is a non-branded campaign. And then they'll go create a branded campaign called defense uh, and ensure that only their brand is showing up there. And then there's other situations where people do it after the fact. They have one campaign that just runs. And then after the fact, they will go periodically, do a search term report, and then do an analysis of like of the search terms that I appeared for, which ones are branded and non-branded. How do you like to do it? What's your ideal? Like, do you like to set up at the campaign level or just do it later in analysis? So my default is that I don't go in with a bunch of negations unless they're terms which are not likely to convert. The reason for negating a term is because the term will not convert for you. So if I'm selling um, a red t-shirt, I'm going to put in the word black as a negative right off the bat and purple and green and everything that's not the color of the thing I'm selling. If I'm selling a men's product, I will most typically put in women or mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. children or kids or whatever. However, I don't do that on the brand basis because I'm only trying to take out things that will not convert. In the end, I want a campaign to make sales, period. 
Now, that's the reason I do it. Thinking from a hygiene point, I can get that, but you actually like thinking it through as you speak. This was this isn't part of my intention, but I'm going to give you a perspective on why you might not want to do that. If it turns out that your non-branded terms are firing for branded search results often, that actually tells you what Amazon thinks about you compared to that term. That is a valuable insight. They're associating your brand with that non-branded term, which is actually good for your brand. Mm -hmm. It means you have become the default for that type of keyword. Mm -hmm. uh, but you lose that insight and you lose that access. I agree. I, 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 if I, my default is to keep everything as one. So like do not negate the branded term. I only would ever do that under like, if there's been a, like a massive request, like we need to control branded spend. We need to do, you know, different kinds of things with branded spend. And then that would happen. But as a default rule, no, I don't, I don't separate them either. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we, I mean, the goal of the campaign is to make sales and however Amazon gets it to make sales, that's what we want out of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The only time that's ever comes up, comes up where it's like, oh, branded traffic begins to creep up to maybe a level that the business didn't anticipate. And then it becomes a conversation. Well, what can we do to control this? And then you have to go in and architect some of the campaigns. It takes a lot, it takes a lot of work and the ROI on it, like the time that you spend on it. Like, like I mentioned, the situation where you try to ratchet down branded sales, like it's pretty time intensive. Uh, and it's, again, there's a, that's where like point of diminishing returns is probably rearing its head. I wish I say it's a good thing. It's good to have branded traffic. These things are interesting to figure out because there are multiple factors at play. One is the considerations of the brand and corporate. So corporate might have a dollar figure. They're like, we want to spend less. And then that turns into where is the easiest place for us to cut spend on things we think people are going to buy us anyway without having spent the money. So it's coming from a cold place. But on the other hand, we're trying to maintain performance of the account overall. And we know that doing one thing has an extra effect in a different place. And we try to balance those things. And we also try to balance the fact that even with the best of intentions, an unexpected might, thing might happen and often does. Mm -hmm. Like you mentioned right in the beginning with that experiment of cutting out everything that had five clicks and no sales. Yeah. Everything mm -hmm. went haywire. Yeah. So thank you for joining us on this conversation. Uh, and Abe, I, I just love these kinds of episodes where it's like talking about a topic and hopefully we've provided people with uh, a different perspective or increased insight in it. Thank you for that. Uh, what are your big plans for 2023? Have anything that you're looking forward to in the world of your business, Amazon entrepreneurship, um, managing clients, Amazon tools? Yeah. So it's interesting you asked that question. Uh, one of the things I've come to realize working with Amazon over over many years, but specifically, you know, I, I've sold on Amazon since the probably 2008, 2009, and I've had my agency for about five years now. And one of the things I realized is that even though I always knew it, it's become more important that other pieces of the puzzle help and are important to ads running well. Yeah. So we've been starting to do more for brands. We started out as an ads only agency and now we're creating listings. We're creating the pieces of listings. So when someone comes to us with a gap, we can take care of the gap. Yep. Uh, somebody has a plus content that is missing from two thirds of their account. Okay. We can get that and that increases their conversion levels by points and points is dollars. Yes. So I'm looking... This has definitely been very exciting. We hired somebody who's uh, ex-L'Oreal and ex-Brooks Brothers to come to our team for content. And um, watching them have discussions with clients about the mood of the photo shoot yeah. has been a big sea change from a world of data and numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's been it's been really, really great. And I'm looking to do forward to doing more of that in 2023. Amazing. Like, it's funny, when you asked this question, I was like, uh, is he going to ask what, about personal or is he going to just stick it, keep it to business? Because the really thing, the, the big thing that I'm excited to try and do is to run with the bulls. Oh, <laughs> um, really? I tried to do it last year and we got pushed off the course. So like a big part <laughs> of me wants to get back into Spain and try and run with the bulls this year. Wow. Well, I wish you good luck in, uh, when you do that. 
Yes, it'll it'll be an adventure for sure. Listen, That's, are you in a, are you are you a, an adrenaline junkie? Are you jumping out of planes too? I am not an adrenaline junkie at all. Okay. My girlfriend is the adrenaline junkie. I am absolutely along for the ride. Okay. And um, I will support her in all the things she does. And this was absolutely her idea. The idea of po- possibly getting poked in the butt by a re- bull's horn was not in- interesting to me until I got there. And now I'm like, oh, we, we got this far. I got to finish it off. Wow. Um, well, that's pretty wild. I think you might become an adrenaline junkie after running with the bulls. Yeah. <laughs> I can I can tell you now, I am not an adrenaline junkie. I do like adventure. I like seeing and learning different things. I want to travel the whole world and see all the things. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like I, I keep trying to convince my kids to come to Iceland to see the Northern Lights and to like uh, swim in an 85 degree pool mm-hmm. with a sea of ice around them. So that's the kind of adventures and things I want to want to experience and ha- have the people around me experience. But what's the what's the last place you've been? I uh, just got back from Miami. Does that count? Yeah, it's like a different world compared uh, to New Jersey. It's a very different world. There's oh, yeah. a completely different energy. Um, Miami is a place where if you're in the city, you always feel like a dance party is almost about to start. Mm-hmm. Like if the right salsa song comes on the radio, you're going to find somebody swaying their hips. Mm-hmm. That is not what it's like in New York. Mm-hmm. Like yeah, that's completely different. I like yeah. the, I like the vibe, and I like the different atmospheres of the different places in the world. That's what I it, it energizes me. Mm-hmm. Well, right on. Well, Abe, thank you so much for coming on the show, dude. Thanks for having me. It was really a lot of fun, and I I'm glad we were able to finally do it. Oh yeah. Until next time. Yes, sir. Mm-hmm.